today, um, what we'll do is, um, in the first half of lecture, we'll cover essentially the foundations of autoaggressive models. In the second half of lecture, we'll cover some of the latest advances. So this is the outline for today. We're going to look at autoaggressive models. It is one type of generative model. Um, as you know, we'll cover multiple types of generative models, five different types in the first five main content lectures of this course. This is one of five. Um, has many advantages, actually quite popular these days, but it's not the only one that matters. Part of what's interesting about the field is that it's not so clear you know, which models are going to be ultimately the most important ones, though certainly for text, it seems that this one is that you have to stay for at least a little while because it's doing really, really good. And also for images, speech is doing quite good. So, um, but again, it's just one of many, and after we've covered all five, five lectures down the line, we'll, we'll be able to contrast them a bit more with each other. So, a bit of motivation. The problems we'd like to solve are multiple. We'd like to train a model that can generate data, meaning we have a data set that already has data, but then we'd like to train a model that we can ask to generate data that is similar to the data that's already in the data set. Um, this could be synthesized new images, synthesized video, synthesized speech, text, and so forth. We'd like to be able to compress data. Um, if we build a good probabilistic model of our data distribution, we know from information theory that if we have a really good model, we can use that to achieve the optimal compression of that data set and future data that is similar, coming from a similar distribution. And so the better we can model the data distribution, the better we can build a compressor for our data if we'd like to in the future, and so the more efficient our codes will be. Um, another big use case of generative models is to detect anomalies. When you just build a classifier, it'll give you an answer, let's say dog or cat or car versus pedestrian. But if the data is out of distribution, it'll just make its best guess unless you have special measures in place to, to do more, whereas a generative model can output a probability of what's on the input under the effectively model data distribution. And so when that probability is very low, you know this is out of distribution. Hence, um, might be something where your classifier, let's say, is not going to give a very precise answer or not likely to give a very precise answer. Today, we'll look at likelihood-based models. We'll look at likelihood-based models, depending on how you think about it, um, in all five types of models that we'll cover. Um, but you know, some of the other models can be thought of in other ways that is sometimes even more popular to think about them a little differently. Um, but definitely autoaggressive models are thought of as likely based models in pretty much every description that uh, is out there. So I'd like to estimate the probability distribution of the data somehow, have that available to us in a model, but we're never going to have direct access to it. We'll just have samples. So that's the problem we'll be faced with. We'll have effectively, um, we'll have samples x1 and so forth to xn coming from the data distribution, and we hope that they're representative enough of the data distribution that we can learn a model that hopefully captures the data distribution well. That model computationally should allow us to compute the probability of x for arbitrary x. So you give a new x, maybe it's images that you're training on, you give a new image, you should be able to compute the probability of that image under the distribution that you learned, and you should be able to sample, ask the model to generate a new image in that case, or new text if you train a text model, and so forth. Today we'll look at um, discrete data. This might sound uh, limiting in some way. In other ways, it might not sound limiting at all. Um, the way it could sound limiting is that you could naturally think of, let's say, speech signals and visual signals as being continuous. How intense is the red, green, blue value? How uh, how much, I guess, pressure is there in the air over time for speech. Um, so in some sense, continuity in that data makes sense to try to account for. But even so, with these models, it tends to be discretized before it's being uh, modeled. And that's what we'll do in the lecture today. Now, maybe there's an opportunity there in the future for you to do autoaggressive models with directly working in continuous space. It's possible. It's not what's worked well for people so far. And I can give you one reason that this might be the case. Um, 
One of the challenges with continuous data is that it's easier to go out of distribution because the space becomes naturally all of a sudden much bigger. And so if you're trying to generate samples with continuous data, you quickly start drifting a little bit out of distribution, even more out of distribution, even more, whereas discrete data almost is like automatic error correction. You stay on the discrete set of points that you're allowed to go on. You don't drift off into continuous space. I'm not saying it's unsolvable, and some people could argue that diffusion models, which we'll cover later, kind of address that problem to force you back onto the manifold. But at least so far, autoregressive models that are successful tend to model data as discrete. Even when its images are speech, it's turned into discrete data before it's been, uh, a model is being trained on it. So we want to estimate distribution of complex high dimensional data. Let's think of a very simple image that doesn't even feel that large. A 128 by 128 by three for red, green, blue pixel values image, that's roughly a 50 dimensional space. 50,000 numbers between zero and 255 that you're specifying to specify this image. So even for something that sounds pretty small, actually the reality is that it's quite high dimensional. And so even though we'll build intuition by initially looking at one dimensional distributions, we'll have to grow from there to building things that can handle high dimensional distributions that are not even close to one dimensional. We want computational and statistical efficiency. We want our model to train efficiently, computationally, and in terms of data needs. Uh, the model itself should also be efficient. Uh, ideally, the model isn't too large because a large model would be more expensive to work with, more expensive to store. Um, obviously, the best models tend to be quite large, but you, know, you hope that they're not unnecessarily large. You want expressiveness, right? You don't just want a, a fast model that can't express the distribution well. It's fast, but it's, it's useless. We want generalization, not just memorization. We want good sampling quality and speed, and we want a good compression rate and speed. So here's how we'll go through this. We'll first look at one dimensional distributions. Then we'll take the step to high dimensional distributions. And then we'll do a deeper dive into the current most popular type of autoaggressive models, which are the causal mass neural models. And pretty much the entire second half of lecture will be on that. But the other models I think could be relevant in the future and can also give us a building block to understanding the ones that matter the most today. So in the first half, we'll have a broader scope make sure we understand the foundation. Second half, we'll go deep on the ones that are most popular today. And at the end, we'll say a little, about, little bit about some things that aren't necessarily super popular today yet, or maybe will never be, but you don't know ahead of time that we still want to make you aware of. Okay, let's say we just need to model a one-dimensional distribution. Um, maybe we have a data set and the uh, samples are integers from let's say zero through 100 is what they can be. And here's what our data set looks like. That's our train set. We have you know a good fraction that land around 80, a good fraction that are clustered around 30, and then it tails off from there in both cases. That's our data. Um, the model we could use that we've already drawn up here is a histogram. A histogram just effectively counts how many data points are there of each type. And then you just plot it out like we did here. And you say, okay, the probability of being the number 40 is essentially reading it off from that plot about 0 0.014 or something, 0 0.013, something like that. Um, the number that lives essentially right at the 40 mark here. There's a number here. And so that would be the probability of it being 40, and that's a probability distribution. It's a very simple distribution. It consists of 100 numbers, effectively, that each indicate how likely it is to get that number. They add up to one. Very, very simple. Easy to execute on. Um, so I guess for something like this, it would be easy to do. So the, the downsides will be different from it being easy or hard to do. Um, but let's take a look at what it can do. Inference, if you want to query the probability for an arbitrary uh, value i, simply you do a lookup in the array that you have, p1 through pk. To sample, and I want to be explicit about the sampling here because this is actually how everything we'll sample will end up like that. So the model has probabilities, 
P1 through PK. Now you want to sample something from the model. What do you do? Well, it's easy to sample from the 0, 1 distribution. Now maybe some theoreticians will, will argue that's also hard, but essentially we assume that we can sample a random number uniformly from 0, 1 easily. There are random number generators that do a good job at this. And with access to that, we turn that into a sample from this histogram. And the way we do it is that essentially we build the cumulative distribution. So the histogram looks something like this, right? Very rough sketch. The cumulative distribution effectively adds all that up. Something like this. I didn't mean it to overlap, but it runs between zero and one. You sample between zero and one some number. If you sample this number, you go here. And then this is the corresponding sample that you get. So the zero one lives on this vertical axis where you sample uniform from zero one and the cumulative distribution uh, tells you where you land on in terms of data point. Um, mathematically, you can also say, okay, you sample number between zero and one and then you return the smallest i such that your random sample is smaller than fi, which is f is the cumulative distribution number associated with i. By the way, when we do the high dimensional models, we sample from them, we effectively will we'll do the same thing or maybe you know some tool will do it under the hood for you, but this is how this is done um, in essentially all cases. Any questions about this part? Okay. So we know how to, I guess, model a histogram. We know how to evaluate probabilities. We know how to um, sample from it. That's all good news. Are we done? Um, no, obviously not. Um, the issue here is that it often has very poor generalization, right? Because every bin is modeled independently from every other bin. So anything that you learn about, you know, the number 40, how frequently that occurs, tells you nothing about any other number. And so if you have a large possible set of outcomes, well, then you're not going to have much data relative to that set of outcomes. And you have, you have many bins that are essentially staying empty. I have no idea if they even should be non-zero probability or not. In this case, it's a relatively low dimensional distribution. But even so, with a good amount of samples from a low dimensional distribution, just 100 possible outcomes, um, we see already a, a pretty big mismatch between train and test uh, distribution, which will mean that the train distribution will not have that great generalization on, onto test if we just fit the histogram. What can we do that might work better? We could choose a parameterized curve instead um, that essentially assumes that nearby things might be somewhat equally likely. 40 is very likely, then 41 might be quite likely too because they're similar numbers. Now it all depends on where these numbers come from. If these numbers come from, you have words in a dictionary, you go from the first word in a dictionary to the second one to the third one, this assumption will likely not be true. But if you think about pressure in the air for speech, or you think about red, green, blue pixel values, it is quite likely that, you know, if a high red value is likely, then a nearby high red value is probably likely too. And that is what this kind of um, essentially fitted distribution with a parameterization can give you. So the yellow curve here is maybe what we'd rather end up with rather than the pure histogram. By the way, if you think about it, the histogram fits your training data more precisely, right? It's the much more, it's the most precise fit you can possibly get of your training data. It's just that it doesn't generalize well. And that's why we're still thinking about maybe doing something else, like we'd like maybe to end up with that yellow curve. So how are we gonna do that more formally? And this will translate over to everything we do later. We call it the goal is, the goal is to estimate the data distribution, right? Um, from samples. We'll introduce a parameterized model, p theta, p theta of x, and the goal will be to learn a theta such that p theta of x is close to the data distribution, where of course we don't have the data distribution, we just have these samples from the data distribution. To learn theta, as if you've done any work in machine learning recently, you might expect, we're gonna pose this as an optimization problem. We're gonna somehow define a loss function that defines distance between these two distributions, and then we're going to find the theta that minimizes the distance, the loss that we incur between these two distributions. Where we don't have access to the actual distribution, of course, the data distribution, we just have access to the samples. 
We want the loss function plus the search procedure to have a few properties. It needs to work with large data set. N is large, say millions or billions of training examples is what we want it to work with. We want a theta such that P theta matches P theta closely. Um, that is the training algorithm must work well. Um, we need to think of the loss essentially as a distance between distributions. We want to get it as close as possible to zero distance. Um, Note that the training procedure can only see the empirical data distribution, not the true data distribution. We want the model to generalize. The procedure that we'll use in this lecture, and this will change a little bit in some future lectures, though there will be strong connections, um, is maximum likelihood. In maximum likelihood, the loss function put forward is essentially saying that we want to minimize the negative log likelihood of each data point. Okay? So when you have that curve that we saw, the height of that curve, essentially the probability under that distribution, you essentially want where there's a lot of data, that curve to be high. That you want to allocate a lot of high probability there. And then where there's not a lot of data, allocate low probability. That's essentially what this will do for us. Um, Another way to think of it, obviously, flipping the sign, we try to maximize the log probability of our data points, the sum of the log probabilities of our data points. So among all choices of the parameter theta or parameter vector theta, we want to find one that makes our data most likely. Statistics actually tells us that if our model family is expressive enough and if enough data is given, then solving this maximum likelihood problem will yield parameters that generate the data or data, you know, very similar to the data. Equivalent actually to minimizing, minimizing the KL divergence between the empirical data distribution and the model. So my, minimizing this negative log loss here is the same as minimizing the KL between the empirical data distribution and the parameterized distribution that is our model. From a compression perspective, what that tells us is that effectively we're finding the distribution that allows us to maximally efficiently compress the data if we wanted to. So that could be an additional motivation why we would want to do things this way. Remember in the first lecture we talked about if you can compress your data well, the problem means that you discover patterns in your data very well, so it's a good representation that you're learning. Okay, so we have a loss function. We need to optimize it. Um, we're minimizing an expectation, um, the expected negative log probability of our, over our data points. Um, and what stochastic gradient descent does is instead of looking at the entire objective in one go, taking the gradient and then taking a step, it'll look at a subset of the data, take the gradient on a subset of the data, take a step and repeat. And the reason that alpha works better is because you look at a smaller amount of data, it requires less time to compute the gradients on that. And often there's already a lot of signal. You can take that step. And then the next time you look at the next batch of data, you're already in a better spot before you evaluate the gradient a second time. And so overall, you make more progress that way than um, by doing everything in one big batch and then taking a step. Now with today's compute, there's trade-offs there. I mean, theoretically, likely it's best to do one at a time but because of compute being available to us as parallel compute rather than uh, serial being equally fast, essentially see whatever fits parallel into your machine. That probably defines your batch size. That all goes in one go, and that will optimize your wall clock time in terms of how fast you can, you can optimize. So question here and a question there. Let's start here. So why would you, it be ideal to only do one at a time if you wanted to have your... Yeah, the intuition of behind doing one at a time if, if let's say you had no parallelization available, you had to do things serially anyway, is that you land in a better spot. So like once you do a bit of compute, you might as well use the information that comes from it to get you in a better spot rather than ignore it till you've done that bit of compute number of times equal to data set size and then only combine it all together and do a step and do your new evaluations of gradients. Uh, that's the intuition. Um, I don't know if there's a hard proof for it, but that's the intuition that most people seem to um, agree upon. Was there a question over there? Yes. Uh, I had a question on the last slide. Uh, sure. In the equation for K1 divergence, um, what is H? Oh, good question. I should have said something about that. Um, so, KL divergence, 
measures the, essentially, let me just write it out, KL, can this pen be a little thinner? Let's see. Seems like thick is the way it is. Okay, KL between two distributions, let's say P and Q, and let's say it's discrete, is the sum over I, PI log PI over QI. And so what's done here is essentially um, this first term here is this part, it's the bottom part, negative cross P log Q. Um, and then the entropy corresponds to the top part. And that's actually the negative entropy. That's why I need to put a negative in front of the H, negative entropy. Yeah, thanks for the question. Now, one thing to note here is that the entropy of the data here is not something that has the parameter theta in it, so you, you kind of don't do anything with it. It's more like a mental construct to show that um, Minimizing KL divergence between data distribution and your parameterized distribution is the same as minimizing the negative log likelihood. And it can give you intuition about why that might be a good thing to do. But nothing changes. This is just a constant term, no matter what your choice of, of theta is. The beauty of maximum likelihood in SGD is that it works with large data set, it's compatible with neural networks, so we can do all the things that we want to do uh, a bit later in this lecture. Question in front here. Well, you said one of your problems was that adding more randomness. So the question was, if you evaluate one item at a time in your stochastic gradient descent, would it add more randomness? Absolutely. Um, so you definitely have to account for that with things. If you were to do that with step sizing, with momentum, maybe some other things um, to make sure that you and sometimes maximize the leverage you get out of each one at a time versus the noise maybe dominating if you naively do just one at a time. Um, but yeah, with the right kind of tricks, in principle, the one at a time ought to be most efficient. Exit. Once you have parallelization, it's like batch size equal to what your GPU can take. Yeah, that's a really good question. So why wouldn't it just like drive P theta up everywhere? It's anywhere else. Yeah, anywhere else. Um, because P theta of X over all choices of X has to sum to one. We haven't put that as an explicit constraint here. We're assuming that the parameterization we choose is such that every choice of theta, no matter what you choose, the sum of all possible values of x of p theta x will be equal to 1. Now, if you chose a model that doesn't have that property, it wouldn't really be a proper distribution p theta of x. It would be what often is called an energy-based model. There you have to take a lot of care that you don't just drive probabilities up in various places, but then forget to drive it down in other places. And uh, we won't have a dedicated lecture to energy-based models, but GANs, genetic adversarial networks, can be interpreted as energy-based models. Here's an example of the training in, in progress. It's a mixture of two logistics in this case. Initially, or is it three logistics? Maybe even a four. It, um, initially, it's not a great fit. Um, but then over time, it starts fitting the data quite well. And you can see in the loss here that indeed the loss is getting better and better over time. So I will say this has fallen a little bit out of favor lately. Um, using the mixture of logistics, somehow it seems like the amount of data people have seems that, you know, a softmax output even over 30,000 possible outputs, the amount of data seems to somehow cover it well enough that things work out. But who knows, this could come back, especially for continuous signals where if you want a strong prior on proximity. Yes? Um, do you also fit K in this process? It's a good question. Um, the number of components is effectively a hyperparameter in your mixture of logistics. Um, yeah. If your original data is continuous and you're binning it, then it's also a hyperparameter how many bins you're throwing it into. Um, yeah, those are some choices you might have to make.
Now, it turns out that for most continuous signals that we think of as continuous, it's actually already binned ahead of time. When you look at images, their pixels are binned from 0 to 255. Uh, when you have audio, I think it's maybe, you know, what is it, 24-bit or something quantization. So it's a bit more than the number of bits in a, in a pixel, but it's, it's kind of similar. Um, and so you already have recorded it digitally, so in some sense it's already done for you. You could make it a coarser binning afterwards, maybe, if you wanted to. Um, yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like that 0 0.5 value, is that a hyperparameter? Like, can you make it bigger? Yeah, good question. Why is it 0 0.5 here? This is assuming that everything is integers. So this is a specific example saying if our distribution is integer numbers from, let's say, 0 to 100 or 0 to 255, then we want that bin of width 1 associated with each of the integers, and so that's a 0 0.5 in each direction. I see. And then if you have like floats and stuff like that, then it gets much more complicated, like you would have to really tune that down. If you have floats and that you really want to work with, you might want to work with a real value, um, kind of continuous density if you want to. Um, or you might end up having this, having discretized already, and then you might end up doing the same thing. Um, okay, so we've gone through how to represent a one-dimensional distribution. We've seen the histogram approach and how to do it, very simple, how to sample from it. Um, we've seen the mixture of logistics, but this could be other distributions if you want approach. If you have a prior that neighboring bins probably should have similar probability values. It could uh, give a good regularizer. Um, but it has all been one dimensional. Now we'll go to high dimensional, but as you'll see, we'll build up on what we saw to get the high dimensional things to work. So challenge with high dimensional data, as we talked about early on, even let's say for binary MNIST, where every pixel is either 0, 1, 28 by 28 pixel uh, configuration, you have about 10 to the 236 possible images, right? So if you said, I'm going to naively just flatten this out, think of every possible image as a possible sample, and think of it as like a 1D distribution with all the possible samples that could occur, you'd have 10 to the 236 possible images, um, that's very large. Like people train on large data sets, but when they say large, they tend to say billions, maybe trillions of examples. Trillion would be to the power um, 12. So 10 to the 236 is something completely different. Um, so if you even just wanted, you know, a data point roughly covering every possible bin here, it'd be completely out of scope of anything that anybody's even considered doing um, today or probably ever. I think number of atoms in the universe is, is far less than that. So obviously just flattening it out is a, a meaningless approach to follow. What else can we do? Well, we'll look at some alternatives. What we'll cover in this class is autoaggressive models. And here's where we introduce this notion of an autoaggressive model. Um, Autoaggressive model essentially models a high dimensional distribution by modeling a bunch of low dimensional distributions. In fact, by modeling a bunch of one dimensional distributions. Your P theta of X, where X could be a high dimensional vector, for example, 28 by 28 image, so 28 by 28 entries in a single data point, you model it by decomposing into a product of probabilities of, and you, you sequence the pixels in an order, let's say, the next pixel given all the previous pixels. The fact that you can represent a distribution this way is actually guaranteed. Every probability distribution, joint distribution, can represent it as, in this format, in fact, for any ordering you choose of the variables. You can choose an ordering of the variables, whichever one you choose, and then you can represent your distribution as a sequence of conditionals. That's just the chain rule. Always applies. So we're not making any assumptions here about our data. This is always applicable. If you do it this way, it's called an autoaggressive model. Um, are we done now that we know we can essentially just fit a bunch of one-dimensional distributions? 
The answer is kind of no, because it's a one-dimensional distribution conditioned on something very high dimensional. And so a conditional, with many possible things you could condition on, if you naively do without a histogram, you still have an exponential blow up in the number of things you need to count um, or represent. So we need to do a bit more work um, to truly be done. There's different solutions people have proposed. We're going to go through four families of solutions. Turns out, somehow, the third one that I'm going to present, not the last one, the third one is the currently most often used, but that's how logically I think it works out the best to present it to you. Um, the first one will just be a starting point, the second one will be a starting point, the third one will be the one everybody's using today, and the fourth one might or might not be relevant in the future. Basenets, you might have heard of them. They're essentially an autoaggressive model where instead of conditioning on all the previous variables every time, you condition on something called the parents of a variable. So instead of thinking of the variables as a sequence of variables, like the entries in the variable, as a sequence, you put them in a directed graph, direct, directed acyclic graph, and then you call the parents in the graph, the things you condition on, and everything else you ignore. So it sparsifies heavily. Instead of, let's say, if you have a 100-dimensional problem, variable 100 conditioning on 99 previous variables possible values, might only have one or two parents, and so it becomes a lot lower dimensional to represent. Here's a canonical example of what a base net could look like. Um, this is a base net over five variables, B, E, A, J, and M. And what you can see is that the tables associated with each of those variables, I'm only showing four out of five, but um, the tables associated with each of these variables are relatively small. So you could consider just counting histogram approach to each one of those. Um, you can also parameterize this. Um, some base nets use parameterizations. It's not very common, but it can be done. Um, so this is a pretty reasonable thing to do. In scenarios like this, where there's essentially a small number of binary variables that maybe have a causal structure to them. Because um, this sparsification essentially introduces what is best thought of as causal assumptions. Um, if those hold true, you're winning by doing this because you're introducing real-world data structure into your model. It doesn't have to learn it, and so it benefits from having that in there. If that causal structure is not true, you're losing, because your data will not satisfy the assumptions, and it will not be able to represent your data all that well. So in this case, it's just saying that um, the structure in the world is that B and E are independent variables that you can sample first when you generate your data. A then only depends on B and E, and then J only depends on A, M only depends on A. Now, if in reality, the value of M would also depend on E directly, not just through what A has become, then you can't capture it, you're at a loss, and you have a mismatch between what you learn and what's in your data. Um, sometimes it's okay to have a mismatch. You might say, I'm regularizing heavily, I'm close enough, I'm happy with it. Today's most popular models are typically not willing to make this trade-off. Yes? Uh, is it only an issue if you leave out causal connections rather than introduce ones that that's a good question. If you have extract connections, it doesn't hurt you. Where it's going to hurt you is that these tables are going to become larger if you use a tabular approach. Um, and in fact, the models we'll look at very soon, in some sense, can be thought of as base nets, where all the connections are there. Not a single connection is removed. Zero sparsity introduced, effectively, or close to zero. But then, of course, we'll have to do some work to not deal with tables, but something else to represent those conditionals. Yes? Um, when you train a high-dimensional uh, uh, image, do you end up with a base net that looks like that, or do you end up with something that is a very tall graph? Because uh, in the previous equation, Yeah, I think for images, this is just not going to work well. Um, there's no structure that will really capture it all that well. Um, but where it could work better is maybe things like, I mean, this example essentially is modeling, is from a, or actually Stuart Russell's textbook on intro to AI, you know, there could be a burglary, there could be an earthquake, either one of them could trigger the alarm. When the alarm goes, then uh, either your neighbor John or your neighbor Mary could, could hear the alarm and could then give you a call to let you know that your alarm is going off and maybe you should kind of go home, check what's going on, or maybe call the police or something. Um, that's the model that is under here, and I think with that kind of storyline, this model can, can make sense. But you could also then even then argue things like, well, if it's caused by an earthquake, probably Mary's busy like doing other things 
rather than um, calling you, because probably in her house, a lot of stuff has fallen and needs to be, you know, picked up and cleaned up. Or, you know, she might be like, well, if it's an earthquake, I'm not going to call you because you know it's an earthquake and, you know, it is what it is. Everybody knows it was an earthquake. So, I mean, it's still, a, even in a simple story, it's a quite a crude approximation. Imagine, think about like a 28 by 20, or a 128 by 128 image saying that this pixel value here doesn't depend on the ones up there, only through the ones that are here. It just is going to be a disaster to, uh, to assume that. Yes? I would, yeah, there's two reasons you might not want to use this. One is that you don't know the structure possibly. The other one is that there just is no structure. That the reality is that there's just no such structure at all. And so the best structure is to keep all the edges, have a densely connected graph effectively, and then effectively you don't have any benefits of using a, a base net anymore. Great questions, by the way. Thank you all. So, base nets, very efficient, but too strong an assumption in most cases leads to poor fits of your data, especially if you're modeling, let's say, sequences of tokens or text or images or video and so forth. Um, the reason I want to present is because it does exist out there. It's very related to everything else we're going to see. And also, it could make a comeback someday. It could be that at some point, maybe people model more high-level variables are worried about that, like very high-level conceptual variables where there's only maybe 20 variables to worry about, and maybe at those levels of abstraction, it starts making sense to have a sparser model. But for pixel-level or token-level text, it probably will not make sense um, anytime sooner or ever. So we'll switch to solution two, made. You might never have heard of MADE, even if you're working on autographs and models all day, every day yourself as a PhD student, but I think it's the first paper that kind of introduces this idea that is driving everything today. So I want to give credit to the researchers who did this, as well as explain it, because it is the foundation of everything that's happening now. Okay. Here's a picture from the MADE paper. At the time, it was popular to try to do representation learning with autoencoders, and we'll look at autoencoders in a few lectures. Suffice it to say, for this purpose here, is that you have some input variables, x1, x2, x3. That's one data point consisting of three dimensions. Let's say a three-pixel image. It's just to fit on the slide. It's not a real image, obviously, in that case. And what you would do is you try to somehow, with a neural network, get a new representation out. And the way it would be done is you put noise on the x1, x2, x3, and then try to have the neural net denoise it. Huh, like a diffusion model. Exactly, a diffusion model effectively, but that's the context in which this model effectively originated. That was popular at the time around 2015. So, this autoencoder does not output probabilities. It just, when you put in data, it'll turn it into a cleaned up data point. If you put in noise, maybe it'll put, turn it into a data point, but it doesn't output probabilities. You can't put in an actual data point and say, what's the probability of this data point? You can't correctly sample from it either the way this is set up. So what, what change that they made at the time is with May they said, hey, we gotta turn it into essentially a chain rule version of this, where when I generate a cleaned up version of X2, it cannot depend on anything because that's my first variable in the sequence. They sequenced it, in this case, X2, followed by X3, followed by X1, as you can see at the top here. Right? It's px2, px3 given x2, then x1 given x2, x3. And they said, instead of using the full neural net, which would violate some of the assumptions, because, for example, x3 can only depend on x2, not on x1, we need to cut out some edges, such that what I come up here with my distribution for x3 given x2 really doesn't depend on x1. And definitely shouldn't depend on x3. I can't take a look at x3 to generate that. That would be completely cheating. You just copy it over. You'd learn nothing in your model. <laughs> this way, this way, this way, this way, then this way, and that's all we got. That's the only path leading into x3 given x2. What is sitting up here? This is a softmax. So a softmax of x3 given x2. So it's a, essentially a bunch of numbers that sum to one is being output there. 
and then you can sample from that or you can evaluate the probability of that x3 given the x2 you've had so far. So that is the setup for MADE. It feels pretty messy presented this way, but I wanted to do it because that's how it's presented in a paper and that's how you can go see in a paper how it's done. A couple of things to think about is these nodes here don't, don't have to be just single variable nodes. This could be a high dimensional uh, node that has, I don't know, 128 dimensional, 250, 1024, whatever you want to put here. This could be a high dimensional thing because this could be essentially a full multi-layer perceptron node sitting there. It could be other things sitting there. But the key is that the structure is going that way. And so going from how MADE presents it to how it's typically presented today, this slide shows you how typically people would draw it today. You have the input sequence at the bottom, you have the predictions at the top, you have a causal mass structure running left to right. And you see the top is shifted by one, it makes it a little easier to kind of cleanly draw the causal mass structure. Sometimes it's not drawn that way, but um, often it is done the way I'm showing it here. So that's made. Interestingly, it's also every one of today's models pretty much. You just need to fill in more details on top of this. Yes? Are the connections being masked? Is that the so what I'm going to talk about masking is the connections that are not there anymore. So in principle, if you had a more dense neural network, there could be other connections that run right to left. But there's no right to left connections anywhere. A dense neural network could have those. But then we're violating the chain rule property that we want to satisfy to get a proper distribution representation. So that's why we need to run, in this case, left to right um, to get that. Yes? When you say that, like, actually, there's no other way you need that. And then you mask out, like, that sounds a little like dropout as you said earlier. Or can you a similar idea to dropout when you change the, the masking, effectively change the order of the variables throughout your, your let's say, your epochs. Um, it's a bit like dropout. You try to somehow get some parameter sharing going between different representations of your data. Now, of course, if your data has a natural sequence to it, reordering it and hoping that that will actually be meaningful might not be a good thing. You might rather than regularize in a good way. You might actually like make it harder to learn the pattern. But if you had just, um, I guess, I don't know, some, some data points that have no natural sequence to them, um, then it could make sense to run this in different orderings through the same neural net and effectively do dropout that attains the autoaggressive ordering for your ordering of choice at any given time. Yes? In the original paper, before the masking, did they still make the assumption of acyclical or did they just really do a full and complete graph? Um, it was always acyclical. It was all set up as a feed-forward neural network. It was just not set up as a... Um, chain rule satisfying feed forward network. So I think, yeah, you can have a cyclical graph, which has other complications, then you have feed forward network, which is most commonly used, and then you can do causal masking to get the models that we have here, so you actually get a probability distribution out. This actually goes back to an early question. Somebody asked, oh, how do we know that it's not going to pull up P theta of X very high in all kinds of places? Because we're forcing it to sum to one. And the way we're doing it is by forcing it to satisfy the chain rule. The distribution we represent satisfies the chain rule. The, if you want to evaluate the probability of a specific data sequence, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, we can just feed that in, and we look at the softmax reading that comes out on the top, and we fill in the values, and we look up the corresponding softmax probability value, and that we multiply them together across 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That's going to be a, the correct probability under our model of that specific data point. And we can do that for every data point that's possible, even for things that are not data points that we can feed in. And it'll all add up to one if we enumerate all possible values. In reality, we're not going to enumerate all possible values um, because that's too many. It's not practical. But we know by the way we define the neural net structure that we're satisfying the chain rule. Hence, it will sum up to one. You can't have this like just inflate everything kind of learning happening. Yes? Yeah, and then one way to think of this, and that's also why I want to introduce the base net notion, is that it's a base net where that has the maximum number of edges. Right? You can't have more edges than here. Every variable has an edge to every one, a variable that comes after it. That's the maximum number of edges you can have, and that's what's present here. We'll sparsify this a tiny bit in, in what comes, and we'll do some other tricks to make this more learnable. But um, yeah, you can still think of it as a base net if you want.
Though very few people, if you let's say, say, oh, is GPT-4, is it a base net? Very few people would say it's a base net. Though in principle, I guess you, you could definitely say it. That's part of the perspective I also want to give here. Very special kind of base net, a special kind of structure, but yeah. Was there a question there? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can, let, let's not worry about the details of skip connections or not. Just what, what really matters is that it's up and to the right. Um, you can add skip connections if you want. In some sense, that is, um, it, that's some, some expressiveness you can add in the, what's happening. You could also blow these nodes up and make them much more expressive. You can do all kinds of things with the nodes themselves. Um, yeah, a lot of options. That's actually what Wilson will talk about in the second half, is essentially, all the options of what you can put in there and which ones tend to work well for what kind of data. So it is very important, but I say in this picture, let's not worry about it. We'll worry about it in the second half of lecture the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you need to satisfy that ordering assumption. That's the one thing you cannot violate. Otherwise, you don't end up with a proper distribution. Okay. So, how well does this work? You can run this on MNIST. I'm showing here the actual MNIST data, binarized MNIST data, some, some examples from the data set. It's a digit data set. Um, original is grayscale, but you can turn it into zero, one images. And then you could train a MADE model on this. And let's see what happens. This is made on MNIST through 19 epochs. Initially, when you sample from it, it clearly doesn't generate uh, very natural looking digits or digits at all. But as it trains longer and longer and longer, it does generate things that look more and more like digits. Um, this is an evaluation from the paper. They looked at different number of hidden layers, see how that helps. They also looked at having multiple orderings in the training where you don't always use the same ordering, see if that helps. Um, in this case, negative log prop, you're minimizing that, so the lower the better. So it turns out using multiple orderings does help a little bit in somehow internalizing more about this, this data distribution. Um, another thing that did in the paper and is interesting to do with all your generative models is generate images and then look up the nearest neighbors in your data set. And you might say, well, those nearest neighbors aren't exact matches and that's exactly actually what you want. You don't want them to be exact matches. If your nearest neighbors are exact matches, it means that it just memorized entries in the data set rather than having learned a general concept of how to generate examples that are similar to the data set. So this is a good thing that it's not perfectly matched. You probably want it to be a little closer matched than it is here. If you had a real good model that was trained on this data and had you know, really captured what it means to be a digit, but it is a good thing that it's not perfectly matched. In fact, it's always what people ask, right? You have a new, when somebody generates some beautiful art with an AI system, it's like, well, was it in the data or did AI actually come up with this? And you need to go do a nearest neighbor lookup on the training data to know whether the AI was creative and generated something interesting new or just had memorized something cool that it now just spit back out. Um, you can change the ordering. So here they did random permutation, even then odd, raster scan, that's like top left to right going down. That's the most natural one probably that you would think of. Uh, go column wise top to middle, bottom to middle. Um, so you see that the ordering does matter a little bit in the quality of samples you get. Interestingly, the log loss is about the same for all of these. So what this is showing is that somehow log loss, at least in this regime, is not perfectly representative of whether it looks qualitatively correct to us. So we would, I think most of us would say that the ones, you know, the third and the fourth one, maybe the fifth one look better than the first and the second one. But the log loss doesn't say so. Log loss says it's about the same. And that's actually often the case, especially when your generations are still quite far from being really good. The log loss can be quite um, inconsistent with which models are qualitatively better looking or worse looking. Um, it often correlates better once you're in a regime of very good models. <clears throat> 
Here they looked at how many different masks should you use during training. Um, too many different masks makes it too hard to fit the data. Too much sharing of parameters effectively across many possible orderings. Looks like six, seven masks was the right way to regularize in this, uh, this case. Okay, that was made. That's effectively what's being used today, except that it's missing a lot of the tricks that matter. Yes? Correct. So the way you sample is X, on X1, you will have a softmax that is conditioned on nothing. If you have an unconditional generation, you just sample from that softmax. You feed it into the network. Then you'll get on the output, you'll get a softmax output for X2. You'll sample from that. You feed that sample also into the input. Now X1 and X2 are fed in together. You'll follow the path to the softmax for X3. You'll sample X3 and you repeat. So you can see it's a serial process. It's one after the other after the other. Um, means it can be a slow sampling process. There are tricks to speed it up, but fundamentally it is, has some slowness to it because it's not parallelizable. You can only start sampling X3 once you have sampled X1 and X2, and only after that you can do X4. So there is this serial character to sampling. During training, it's all parallel. It's just one forward pass, you do the log prop losses, and one forward backward pass, get the gradient. But the, during sampling, indeed, it has this slowness due to ser serialization. That's just part of how it's done. The chain rule says one has to come after the other. Yes? Yeah, so when, when in the made paper they use different orderings, what it means is they start with a densely connected feed forward network. And by choosing an ordering, they remove a bunch of edges from that densely connected network such that the chain rule ordering is satisfied for the ordering you chose. And so essentially removing a bunch of edges, then doing a training on that network. And then when you choose a new ordering, you again start with the dense network, remove some edges to satisfy the ordering and repeat. That sharing can also be a burden sometimes. It might be too much sharing at times between the different um, orderings, and it might be hard to learn that we saw in that curve when it's trying to combine so many different orderings, the loss is getting worse when you have too many different orderings that you try to squeeze into a single network to somehow master them all. Um, when you train with multiple orderings, I guess it just has a regularization effect. Six, seven, eight is the right amount, and um, yeah. It's probably just the regularization that's helping you. And at sampling time, you just pick an ordering, you use it to sample, and that's it. I think if you want to know the probability of a sample, you probably just use all seven orderings, and you take the average log probability of all seven of them to get a good log probability estimate of that specific uh, input that you got. Yes? So the question is, do we need to add noise because they're discrete variables? No, we don't need to add any noise. That's not necessary. So the speed just disappears after that? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So MATE is expressive, but there's not enough parameter sharing for efficient learning compared to the things we'll see now. So causal mass neural models, those are the winning approach today. They parameterize the conditionals with a neural net, just like made. It's still chain rule, but parameterize conditionals with a neural net. Parameter sharing across the conditionals. So the conditional used for xi given xi minus 1 back all the way to 1 is the same such a neural network parameters used for the next one, for the next one, the next one. It's the repeated use of the same parameters. So it's like a sliding window in some sense, the way you think of it, that the same parameters are being reused. And you also add coordinate coding. Um, because what, if you do naive made type modeling, um, you just don't know where the pixel is located in the image. Nothing's telling you that. Um, if, especially once you start sharing parameters, there's no way. Once you share parameters, they'll just slide over everything. You have no way of knowing where you're at in the image. So you need to put that information back in. So instead of having different parameters for different locations, with the same parameters for all locations, 
but we input the location coordinates so it can learn in the parameters how to account for that. So picture looks the same. It's just now you get these coordinate codings being passed in. They're not necessarily a one, two, three, four, five. They can be one hot encodings. They can be relative coordinate encodings relative to their neighbors as they're being fed into the next layer. So there's a lot of details to choose. But at a high level, think of it as it's like a made model, but we feed in the coordinate locations also, and there's parameter sharing. Um, so let me be very explicit about that. Typically, and there could be even more parameter sharing, but at the very least would be that what's happening on this edge over here is the same as what's happening here and here and here and here. And same for all the other edges that appear in a similar configuration, but just shifted in time, they'll have the same parameters. And now you can have very high dimensional data, yet a relatively low amount of parameters still. Or alternatively, the way you can think of it is that each one of these can become pretty large on its own because it's going to be shared anyway. So you have a very large MLP sitting right there doing a lot of work. And that's possible because you reuse that MLP layer so many times, you get enough data to train the parameters of that MLP. And then you kind of uniformize it maybe with, with padding. So um, you, it might actually look like this possibly in practice where you add some blanks in the front because if everything's looking back five locations, then in the front, do you want to really architect your neural network to be different there? No, probably not. Um, but the front is kind of a mess. It doesn't make sense. So you put some blanks and then from there, everything is your actual data. Even you would have no loss on, on the blanks, obviously. So one of the first models that did this and did it very successfully was WaveNet. It did it as a convolution because what you saw here effectively already looks like a convolution. You don't have to do it like a convolution, but that's how it was done. Um, it was able to generate speech at a level that was much better than anything that had been done uh, before. So it's really what I just showed to you, but then think of this as all two by two, in this case, convolutional masks. You don't even look five back, you just look two back, that's it, and that's how you uh, train your sequence model effectively. Um, there were some additional tricks they introduced because they wanted to look further back, so they used dilation in their convolutions where it's not looking back to just the previous one, but it's hopping further back, and so it can learn to take information from further back. The hope is that the information further back because it's deeper in the network, has summarized what's underneath it, and so you get some kind of abstract version of what's underneath as a whole taken into the future and can that way account for a longer past in a way that hopefully um, is right to be able to generate the next uh, part of speech. It doesn't have to be for speech, by the way. Um, it can be for other data too. There's also a little trick um, that was used at the time that's not so popular anymore these days, but I'll point it out here. You see this tan H and sigmoid? So it's essentially MLP, but then the MLP would um, both have a tanH output and in parallel a sigmoid output, and the sigmoid would gate the tanH. Today's world, essentially attention models do the gating of the sigmoid. It's the same kind of thing. It's effectively if the values are part of being passed in one thing, then um, the key values are doing the gating of the uh, the key query are doing the gating of the sigmoid. It's the same idea. It was just in some sense an early version of the same idea that you compute values that you want to propagate. You also want to compute something that decides how to gate it or not gate it, and then decides whether or not to pass something on. The reason that people came up with it back then, and maybe slightly different than it is done today, is uh, essentially the thinking was that computing a precise value is hard, especially getting something to be zero. If you want nothing to go on, nailing something to zero is very hard with this 10 h But if in parallel you have a sigmoid, nailing something to zero is easy because you just drive a sigmoid very negative, that becomes zero, you multiply it into whatever the tan h did, and you get your zero out. So in some sense, the sigmoid gives you the power to zero things out, which would be very hard to do with just the tan h, uh, where you'd have to so precisely position your output right onto the zero uh, on the output. WaveNet Lemnist, people didn't do this. It's not a thing to do. It was designed for speech, but Wilson did it, <laughs> um, made it work. Um, it looks a bit like MADE on MNIST. Um, I would argue it actually looks slightly worse than MADE on MNIST. 
why is that? Because it's a, it's a convolutional character of how it's done. It's lost this notion of location in the image. So we come back to it. We now add coordinate coding. Every, every um, entity now knows the coordinates of where it's located in the image. You run the training that way, all of a sudden things come out the way you hope for, and I would say actually better than the main results were. So causal mass neural models, um, essentially made, but with you know, more parameter sharing. That's ultimately what it is. Um, add the coordinate coding to make up for the parameter sharing. It's expressive, it's efficient. The question about sampling remains. When you sample, you still, one at a time, it's gonna be a bit slow. Um, but training is very fast. Everything's done in parallel. All the losses and all your um, entries in your data can be done all in parallel. If your machine is large enough, you can do one thing, everything in one go. Um, expressive, efficient for training, a little slow on sampling. Um, any buts? The possible concern is finite context window. I mean, how far are you really looking back? Are you forgetting things? Are you trying to process a very large image? Do you know the beginning of that image to really then generate the end of the image correctly? There are tricks that um, allow you to have very large windows these days. There is um, flash attention, ring attention, and so forth that allow you to get pretty large context. I, and Wilson will talk about how attention fits into this. Um, retrieval can help. So in some sense, the concern about finite context is alleviated by finite is actually very large and you can do retrieval. So effectively, you still get everything. That said, you could still be concerned conceptually that finite context is not what you want. If you're conceptually um, bothered by that, um, and maybe it's good to be bothered by it, you can think of recurrent neural nets as an alternative solution. So they can do infinite look back in principle. What does it look like? Um, again, in this case, it's illustrated with um, characters as inputs, but essentially you have input layer, a hidden layer, an output layer, and what you see here is in the hidden layer, you get this horizontal propagation, which effectively means we had no horizontals in the previous models. It was all up, diagonal, up to the right. The horizontal allows you to remember everything from the past. If your model is large enough, you can effectively put into that middle layer a compression of everything from the past that matters for the future. That's the beauty, that's the idea. Um, in practice, does it really remember everything that's relevant from the past? Does backpropagation give you enough signal to tease apart what you really should remember from a thousand, a million, a billion steps back? Not really. And so in practice, it doesn't work as well as you hope for. And in practice, as far as I can tell, it tends to work worse than the models we just talked about but maybe somehow somebody gonna get it to work. Maybe one of you is gonna get it to work in a way that it does work really well and will make a, a full comeback. And Wilson has some hints on some recent works that are trying to get this to work that are showing some signs of life. Um, run on MNIST, I think Wilson, I think that was also you, um, thank you. Um, with um, coordinate coding, again, it does better, same thing here. Um, in principle, maybe the memory could remember where you are by counting. You know, I'm one step into it, I'm two steps into it, maybe. But if you don't force the memory to do that and you just give it, it actually works better. Um, so might as well give it to it. Um, downsides. Certainly it's expressive. Um, downsides, let me highlight here. Not as amenable to parallelization. Um, with the causal mass models that go diagonal off to the right, it's one parallel pass through the network. Everything, no, nobody has to wait for anybody else. One parallel pass through to do your training. With the horizontal connections, everything has to wait for what came before. And the things that happen at the end will only be able to happen to do their forward pass once you made all your way through. So much, much slower to train more memory requirements typically to train, so a lot of challenges there. Backrupt to time, as I mentioned, can, can have exploding or vanishing gradients. Vanishing meaning you don't get any signal from the things that are far away. Exploding means somehow it blows up, and your gradients become infinity, and they become useless. Um, hard to truly have the signal propagate, right? The benefit is it will be less than advertised. 
and it's expressive, you think it's more expressive because it's these horizontal connections. But actually, let's take a look at the next slide. I'm going to argue it's actually less expressive than the causal models that we've seen before. This is a standard causal mass neural model that common models use today. And you'd say, oh, if I have this horizontal thing in there, it's going to be more expressive. But the reality is, if you think about it, you have a certain amount of compute budget, and so you need to kind of map these to each other. And what I'm going to show to you is a bit hand wave. It's not perfectly correct, maybe, but I think it gets the intuition across. Effectively, what the RNN is doing is to restrict itself to the blue connections, which are the encoder connections, the red connections, which are the horizontal paths in the RNN, and then the green connections, which are the decoder connections of the RNN. It looks different in the RNN. It gets reshuffled to look differently. But effectively, you think of an RNN as a extremely tall causal mass model, extremely tall, the length of your data tall causal mass model, which typically you wouldn't do that tall. That would be very, very tall. But make it that tall and just use the diagonal effectively. And that should show you that in some sense, you're very restricted in what you're capable of doing when you're doing an RNN compared to an actual causal mass model. Um, and so that should concern you. And I think if you do an RNN, what that also means is that you probably need a very fancy encoder that encodes things really well, such that because that, you only have that diagonal available after that, that diagonal, which is shared parameters, must do all the work of propagating forward, must have some really meaningful things it can propagate forward, otherwise it's just not gonna succeed. So yeah. Don't take this picture to literally just be clear. I've never seen this picture before. There might be some intuitions that are a little off in this picture, but I do think, think of an RNN as just a very, very extremely tall standard causal mass model, as tall as your data length, and only using the diagonal is more or less correct and can tell you why maybe it's not the best way to do it. Okay, um, first half of lecture, we covered how to represent high dimensional distributions in different ways, but especially so using a causal mass neural model is a way to represent these distributions, be able to sample from them, and evaluate the probabilities of new data points that come in. What we haven't looked at is the details of these neural models, and they really matter to get good performance, so that's what we'll do now. We saw the 1D convolution, that was one detail, one specific model that led to the best uh, speech generation at the time. Now, several years ago, there are some better ones since then, but it's still a, a landmark result at the time. How about images? Um, images, convolutions are often coming in handy to capture the fact that in images, things that are close together um, might need to be processed together. It's more meaningful. And then from there, build out a more global understanding of the image. Um, so we can do a causal mass model, hopefully where the connections are effectively convolutional connections in 2D instead of 1D. Um, the way you can do this is, for example, all of your convolutional masks are, or convolutional filters are three by three. And you mask out the center, because that would pass along the thing that you are yourself to the end, and you can't do that, it has to be causal. Um, you only leave the entries that are ahead of you, in this case in the top left to bottom right scan order. Um, so if those are all the convolutional filter structures with the zeros being hard zeros, you can't change those. Um, the other entries can be learned or really this is a mask you apply to the learned entries. So everything stays zero in the bottom five there. Nothing can propagate in a way that's disallowed. You are applying the chain rule correctly and you learn a causal mass model that also captures convolutional structure uh, or priors during the learning process. Um, you can then sample from this. I thought the time was pretty surprising. Nobody was really doing it at the time. This first paper called Pixel CNN, it's like, we're gonna generate images one pixel at a time. It's like, wow, how does that make sense? But somehow it kind of just, just worked. Um, as I went through this, you can see it's a softmax every time. You sample from that softmax, feed it in the sample as the next pixel, repeat. And it's a long process to step through every sampling step. And in the end, you get your sampled image. You do get a blind spot in this case. 
um, because if you think about how that works, the, the masking, and you reapply the convolution filter, reapply repeatedly. If you have a regular three by three, you expand in all directions equally, and at the end you have a vi um, kind of visual field of your, uh, essentially your output can be determined, uh, depend on everything. But in this case, it can only depend on things that come before, but actually less than that. The things on the top right are actually not being sucked into what it's uh, looking at, which um, can be a problem. In the top right, there's something important for you generating at the bottom left, you're just not gonna have access to it. And so it limits the expressiveness of what you can do, but on the upside, you have a strong prior, convolutional filters that can help you um, learn faster. There are, I should say, there are some solutions to this. Um, we put them in the appendix this year. Four years ago, it was part of the main lecture. The best models were using this. Today, the best models are using attention, which Wilson will talk about, which is a little easier to do the masking with without having the blind spot. And so, but if you're curious about doing convolutions and not having the blind spot, check the appendix of the slides after lecture and you can learn about how to circumvent this, but it's very, it's difficult to implement. It doesn't feel like it's exactly right in terms of having the right prior either. And so that's probably why it's, combination of those two is probably why it's falling out of favor because the alternative is so much easier to implement. And so it's natural to go for that if it works well. Wilson. All right, all right, see if we can use this. So uh, okay. I'll help you for a moment. So you have to activate the pen down here on the dots, turn on the pen. And you have to then use the arrow to go forward and backward. Uh, okay, and then I can. Yeah, you're also working out with gestures. Uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So I will be pretty much this next most of this next half of lecture will just be about transformers uh, and attention and everything about them, and then uh, we'll cover some other stuff at like the very end. Okay. So. I guess Peter has talked a lot about mass convolutions, uh, made like masking in the in the weights of the neural nets. Um, now we'll talk about another form of masking, which is a lot more easier to implement and also kind of understand um, in terms of when you actually like like implement like a neural net with this kind of masking. So one of the main problems with like the, the com nets, the for wave net, the, the 1D coms, for pixel CNN, the 2D coms, is that the receptive field will grow like linearly, essentially, with the number of layers that you have. So we, so that's not exactly good if you want to learn and capture like long horizon dependencies across like across the image, if you're learning video across time for language, across like long paragraphs. So here comes self-attention, which has, which is a pretty nice design choice in that it technically could have an uh, unlimited receptor field as long as you have like an unlimited amount of compute. Uh, it has nice scaling properties with data. So basically, as your sequence dimension grows, your the number of parameters you have wouldn't grow. So for example, if you had a pixel CNN and you want to train on larger images, then you could grow your receptive field by growing your the, the size of your convolutional kernel. Um, but that also scales with, like the number of parameters scales with the sequence length or number of pixels, which isn't that ideal. And the other really nice thing is parallelizable computation, which pixel CNNs can do, but RNNs could not. Um, which makes training like really fast and efficient. Okay, so this is how scale dot product attention works. So essentially the way I like to think about it is kind of like a like kind of like a soft lookup table essentially. So you have three components to your model. You have the queries, the keys, and the vectors. And then you consider like a single query here, and then you can think of your, your KV as like a lookup table. So you have the, it's like a kind of like a dictionary, I guess like a continuous form of a dictionary. So where you have the key, which is a vector, and then the value, which is some, some other embedding. And then you have that for like, for essentially each token in your sequence. So if you're doing language modeling and you have like n tokens or n, n words, um, then you, can, you want to try to attend to, for a single query, to like which word do I want to attend to. And the way this is formulated is through kind of like a softmax structure. So right here. Software right here, where you can basically compute similarities through a dot product here. 
of Q transpose K. And then the scaling factor of root D is, is not that, I mean, it's not that important theoretically because it's, it, it makes everything equivalent because it's, it's going to be like canceled out at, on the numerator denominator. Um, but it's fairly important for like stable training um, because as like your dimensions, because if you want to say scale your model up, you might want to increase the dimensions of Q and K. Uh, and then basically the variance of that would also, your dot product would also grow with dimension D. So you kind of want to keep it relatively controlled regardless of how you scale your model. Um, but what you do is you compute, for like one query, you compute the similarity for each key, and then you do a softmax to normalize. So now you have essentially like a, kind of like a soft distribution, like a soft version of a one-hot distribution where um, the where you basically get probabilities uh, for each index. And, and then it's reweighted, and then basically you compute the output by reweighting the, the value vectors based on the softmax result. And then down there, you have the, here, you have the, the matrix form of it, which is you have matrix Q, K and V are all L by D. So in this case, there's no batch dimension. So your attention matrix, which we usually call this, is going to be something like L, L by L. L by L, and then your V is L by D, so the result will be something L, L by D. Basically, each query taking like, an, like a, a weighted sum over all of the vectors that you can see, or, or all of the values that you can see. And this is an example of kind of what we're describing about the receptive field of self-attention. So you have one index here that can attend to everything in the past, or, or basically everything from the prior row. And then and this is not causally masked yet. So you, you, you can think of it as like a, as, as we're not doing like autoaggressive modeling yet, but a, a generic transformer which can widen its receptive field over the entire sequence. Versus for convolution, it can only see like, let's say two, like plus or minus two tokens uh, like nearby. I think, yeah, I, I, I guess it, it could represent the weighting, yeah. For a convolution, it'd be the, like, the, 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 like the, the value of, like, the, the parameters. Yeah, and of a self-intention, yeah, the attention scores. Okay, and so in the context of self-attention and how we compute that using, like, the attention mechanism is that... I guess the question is, where do the Q, K, and V come from? And so the way the data is propagated is you have like your input X. Oh boy. Can't write too fast. Okay. Okay, you have your input X. Oh, I can't go down. <laughs> All right, okay. We're gonna not write this one. Um, so you have your input X, which is, let's say, your, your sequence of tokens, or, yeah, it's kind of like a, a, a sequence of tokens in a language model. And as you propagate it through the network, through your self-attention layer, is that you will then apply a learnable weight matrix of Q, K, and V to the same X. So then you would basically compute, and then after that, you would use that Q, K, and V and compute your attention. And the output is also something the same shape as X. So basically, you're using your input. So basically, the, 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 everything is driven by the input data. Like the, the keys and the queries are driven by the input values, and also uh, the, values, the values themselves as well for V. Which makes it really nice, because it can, it can then essentially adapt to, the, to whatever data is input. Versus, let's say, if, if you learned, um, like for convolutions, it's kind of like you're learning a weighting that is fixed based on the, the, the weights of the kernels. And if we want to, so now if we want to use these attentions and, and learn something that's actually like autoaggressive, then we need to enforce some sort of a causal mechanism to this. And the really nice thing about attention is that it's fairly straightforward is if you just look at the attention mask. So if you look at um, like QK transpose here, this is basically L by L again. Yeah. All right. Um, it's an L by L matrix, 
and which basically defines all the pairwise interactions between every pair of like like how does uh, the zeroth how, how does the zeroth index interact with the zeroth index? How does the fourth index interact with the second, uh, fifth, and tenth, and or, or whatever? And then kind of similar to made, but here you're masking the attention the attention weights is that you can control the interactions by essentially uh, bringing the, the logits down to minus infinity. And then so when you do the softmax, the weighting will be, will be zero, basically. And the mask we use here is generally just called a causal mask. It's like a, a lower triangular, or it's like a triangular mask, where the, the ith index can only attend to, for, for, for any index less than or equal to i, <coughs> essentially. That's essentially the constraint that's being enforced. And then if you implement it, I guess one common way to do it is that um, you take the attention mask for 2K transpose, and then you have like a binary mask, which is zeros and ones, where one is like the blue, and then zero is the white. And then you just multiply it by a really large negative number. So um, so basically when you do the soft max, it'll be something very, very close to zero. And it'll basically be maxed out at that point. Sorry? Where is the weight? The weight. Oh, oh, sorry, it's not there. It, it should be there, though. Yeah. Yeah, it should be outside the stop max. Okay. The other really nice thing about this is that since it's basically based on the mass, the 2D mass that you construct, you can basically construct in any form you want. You can basically control every pairwise interaction. And then this also means that you can define it, basically any, like, Autogressive ordering, and then <laughs> apply it as a mask, and then you, you can just chain like that. So if you have like some sort of weird pattern like this, then you can just construct a mask for that, and then it'll be fine. And this is the only thing you have to do. There's nothing else you really need to worry about. Okay, and then so now into like the basically the core architecture of, of the transformers, which which uses this attention. So. The transformer essentially just consists of repeating blocks called transformer blocks, and then they have alternating like operations. So the first one is called multi-head self-attention, which models all of like the pairwise interactions or like the interactions across the sequence length or across the tokens. And then the MLP, which is basically a standard MLP, like a single layer MLP that um, expands like the hidden dimension by like a factor of like four or eight and back down. But that, the MLP, I guess important to know is that MLP has no uh, like cross-token interactions. So what it essentially does is if your input is like, if H here is, oh, L by D, then the MLP will just act on this last hidden dimension D. But then, so, which is essentially, it's just like a, like two, two weight, to like multiplications of weight matrices, essentially. Um, and then the self-attention models interactions across L. Oops. And then there's some other architectural designs, like they have like residual connections there and, and some layer norms. There's like multiple kinds of forms, but this exact form is the, the more popular one nowadays. Okay, and yeah, if you just want to now train a, like an autoregressive transformer on these, then you just take your transformer architecture with the attention MLP layers, and then you apply your causal mask in the attention layer, and that's basically it. Um, you don't have to worry about MLP because there's no cross-token interactions there, so you only focus on the attention part when you want to make sure things are like okay in terms of not breaking the autoregressive property. Um, and then the way you sample is very similar to, let's say, a pixel CNN, where you can do four passes through your model and sample one token at a time sequentially. Any questions about any of this? Yeah. I guess for initials, why bother doing anything causal? Because there isn't anything inherently causal in any way? Um, that, that is true. I, I guess it's just one way to model a, a distribution, one way to factorize it. Um, and I guess, and the really nice thing about these autoregressive models is that they can model very complex distributions. Um, but yeah, there isn't anything super inherently causal, of, of like, like 
I guess in this case, what we're just considering is a is an image as a random variable, and then we're just trying to find one one way to model it. Uh, there's many ways to do it. Uh, one way you could is just you, you could just take each frame, you concatenate it, and you do like autoaggressive for every pixel. So you do autoaggressive within each image, and then the next time step, and then you sample each image pixel by pixel, and you do, you do the next time step. And so, uh, oh yeah, and then one quick thing about transformers is that since attention is kind of like, like uh, location invariant, I guess, it kind of treats everything as like a set. There is no, there's no positional information inherent in position or in uh, attention. Um, they're in the very beginning of the original transformer, you add like an like a embedding that basically tells you what position it is or, or, or some kind of information to tell you approximately, oh, this is the zero index, this is the first, second. Um, so then it knows, because maybe that could be useful if it wants to attend to things like if you're printing text, probably the more the useful information is nearby in in, in like in, in in distance to like the current word. So you might want to bias like your attention source to be higher towards like words that are uh, one word away, two words away, three versus ones that are like a thousand away. Okay. And I guess a note about computational scaling, which will be pretty important. We'll kind of go back to this over and over again for the rest of this lecture. Um, is how it scales. So if you count the, the, the flops of these transformers, the multi-head attention uh, has roughly, is roughly O of D squared L plus D L squared, where D is the hidden dimension and L is like the number of tokens or your sequence length. Um, and that's pretty expensive. So it's both quadratic in, in D and L. And then for the MLP part, um, it's O of D squared L. It has slightly more flops in some cases because uh, there's this larger weight matrix, matrices, uh, but in terms of scaling, it's just, uh, only quadratic in D. But what's really going to bite us is the quadratic in L in, in attention. Because we're going to get to really long sequence lengths. Okay, so I guess the next part is now you have this transformer. And one really nice thing about these autoaggressive transformers, or just transformers in general, is that they're very general purpose. There isn't really a strong inductive bias built into the model. If you think of like CNNs, they're built very biased towards, uh, let's say, like for, for images, for modeling images. How it's difficult to take a CNN and model text. Um, and these can model really complex distributions, basically as long as you can find some way to, to make your data discrete. Then you can um, apply the transformer, do a soft max, predict, and model, like, model and sample pretty complex things. So how exactly do we tokenize? So for text, there's many, many ways you could do it. You could do characters, I think, which Peter had for his RNN example. Uh, then your the, the size of your vocabulary would be like uh, like 26, and then um, but the issue is that you or maybe more if you want to do other languages. Um, but the issue is that you then have a very you could have a very large number of tokens. Um, because maybe each, each word has an average like four to six characters, and if you have like a thousand words, then it could be like four to six thousand tokens already. Versus it could be a lot more compact if you just use words. So then it could be four to six times a uh, smaller sequence. Uh, and then you would have a very large vocabulary because now you have to consider like almost every word that exists. Uh, but then there's like an, also an issue of like what happens if we introduce a new word? Then the model just it ignores it. I mean, it's unclear what, what you'd actually do in that case. Um, so what people have found to work best so far, and it's currently one of the most popular ways uh, to convert text into tokens is using bipair encoding, which I'll talk about very briefly here. Um, and it's kind of something, learning something in between words and characters, where it's kind of like a process that, that goes iteratively, where you, you start with every character in your, in your vocabulary, and then depending on how many, like, how many merges, which is like a hyperparameter here, you just choose, let's say like, if you want to target like a codebook size of like 30,000, 40,000, then you choose that many merges. And what you do is you, you go through like your, your training text corpus, and then you, you consider every pair of adjacent tokens and its frequency. And then you, you, you merge the pair that is most frequent, and you add that as like a new entry inside of your codebook. So if you, if you find like AB is a really popular pairing, then you have AB add that as your codebook, and it's a new uh, token. And you consider that also in the, in the future paired merging after you iterate. 
So eventually you, you get a code book with like a bunch of characters and sub words, uh, maybe even some full words that they're popular, like dog or cat could be very common. Um, but then words like xylophone might be less common, so they could be broken up into like, uh, like two halves essentially. So this way you get, um, it's kind of like a middle ground. You get roughly one to two tokens per word. And it's also just generalizes to novel combinations of characters, um, as long as your original characters. Like if you only train on English and you try to tokenize like Japanese or Chinese, it probably won't work because that's, there's no mapping there. But if you want to come up with like a new English word, then that's okay. So I guess, so going by this series of, of, that, of models that actually use these tokenizers is, I'll briefly talk about the GPT series um, from one to three, and then how that kind of showed the actual abilities of, now that we can tokenize this text and we can train it efficiently with transformers, uh, what happens? You know, We're just doing unsupervised learning on text. We scale and scale and scale. What, what benefits do we get in these models? And so GPT-1 was a 100 million parameter model, so very small by today's standards. Um, and that their focus was just pre-training on natural language, and then we want to see how, how it does when we just fine-tune this pre-trained model. And the end result was fairly strong initially, um, where it just outperformed, so, so fine-tuning this generally pre-trained model, so this task-agnostic model, outperforms a lot of the models that were specifically designed for these tasks, like translation or, or QA, summarization, um, stuff like that. And for GPD-2, I mean, the question just keeps on, keeps on going. Like, what happens if we have more data? What happens if we have a larger model size? Um, then what you kind of start seeing is that these models can start, so this is like a 1.5 billion parameter model. So once you keep scaling, you kind of see that uh, these models can start doing these tasks in a zero-shot manner. So you don't even need supervised fine-tuning. You can basically just kind of prompt your model with saying like, oh, uh, so summarize this piece of text and ask it to, to fill in the rest of it just purely from like next token prediction. And it does decent. It still like underperforms, let's say humans for some of them, or even some, some fairly strong baselines. Um, but it was pretty promising results in terms of you needed essentially uh, no supervised data for, for these tasks. And for GPT-3, so this is scaling up to 175 billion parameters. And this was, I guess, something in between. So um, pure zero-shot performance uh, doesn't improve as much, but the in-context learning uh, gets better and better. So now you only need, let's say, you know, uh, two to five examples to, to prompt your model with, and then you can ask it to, to solve the task at hand, and it, it performs quite well as you increase the number of, as you increase the number of shots or examples. Yeah. So that was briefly about language models. We'll have a full lecture on it later on, uh, later in the semester. Um, but for now, we will move on to images and how you can tokenize for images, right? So what Peter mentioned earlier, uh, this lecture was the easiest way to tokenize is just take the raw pixels, right? Um, you consider each HW uh, by three for R, G, and B, and each of them are already stored as a byte on computers. So then you just model uh, you just model these images with a h by w by 3 and then a, a vocab size of 255. And then you just do prediction on that. But the one thing is that this is like really expensive. So if you just even want to model 64 by 64 images, it's 12k tokens. If you want to go to 256, it's 96k, which is very, very large, um, especially because attention scales quadratically. So the number of flops is really, really high, and then if you, if you want to like train on 256 even now, uh, you probably need like, like tens or like 100 GPUs probably. But it, it is possible, just very difficult. But especially if you consider like back in like 2016, 17, um, it was definitely very impossible. So this kind of prompted some work into designing architectures or transformers that can still do attention and attend to most of the context, but with a specific masking structure. So on the left here, you basically have uh, the standard causal mask. So you can attend to everything uh, before. And then on the, the, the other two, 
is still kind of like a castle. It still follows the autoregressive property because there's no like like blue uh, blue tokens in the top right, but some of the ones in the bottom left are are just masked out also. And you you can technically train auto like a like a full transformer with this mask applied. It'll just be really efficient or, or really inefficient um, because you're doing a lot of like dumb computation because you're essentially like ideally you only want to do computation or dot products where uh, the mask is one, so where, where the stuff is not being masked out, essentially. Uh, and in the case where stuff is being masked out, you just don't even want to do that computation to begin with, because it's going to be zero anyways. So there's not much point. Um, so this paper, Sparse Transformer, kind of focused on, this was kind of like a engineering hardware-ish project where they designed CUDA kernels uh, for sparse mat moles. So they designed these sparse masks, and then you can efficiently do these. So I think instead of n squared or l squared, it's something like l, l log n or l, l root n in terms of scaling. Uh, the cost is that you also, you, you don't get to model all of the pairwise interactions, which could be very useful, um, but it allows them to at, at, at least scale to long sequences. Of in, in this case, long is like uh, 10 or 12K. And so yeah, at the time, it was state-of-the-art results on perplexity or, or, like the, or loss, uh, and these are the samples. As, as you can see, they're not, they're not very good. Um, can't really tell what, what it is, um, but yeah, that was what it was like back then. Yes? So in the previous slide, uh, what is the blue, deep blue, light blue, and the gray, and what are the colors? I, I think they were just trying to distinguish between certain kinds of, um, certain kinds of masking. So let's say that, uh, I guess deep blue is always there, and then the lighter, the slightly lighter blue is probably some sort of, I think, local masking of like the past like K tokens. And then the lighter one is like, um, like a strident masking. But in practice, the actual mask, anything that's slightly blue is just one. Anything that is not blue is just zero. So the main contribution that these papers was just changing how you do the masking? Yeah, but also, also now, like basically designing code so that it takes advantage of that hard coded mask and doesn't do like computation doesn't have to do. Uh, or it still tries to capture some of them. It can attend to, like I say, the past three tokens, but it, it, it then can attend to the past, let's say, 100 tokens, but in strides of 10. Uh, and then hopefully the prior token will be offset by one, so you can kind of like gather stuff over long horizon, but it's definitely not as efficient as just full-on attention. Okay. And this is another alternative that also trained on Pixel called IGPT. This one was more of a focus on representation learning. Um, but what was kind of interesting was the way they, they, they tokenized the data. So instead of doing um, RGB pixels, is what they did was they just took like a data set of images, and then they just took all the RGB values as like three-dimensional vectors, and then they, they cluster them with, with k-means, with 9-bit, uh, so 512 possible means, um, to, to cluster all of these colors to find basically the, the modes of the most common colors in the data set. And this is roughly a 3x reduction in sequence length because now instead of having RGB as three separate tokens, you just have uh, one token from value zero to uh, like five, five, eleven, um, which which is nice. And but the main thing about this paper was it was kind of one of the first papers that showed pretty strong representation learning results uh, using these autoregressive models on images. So they trained on pretty small images, 32 by 32 or 64 by 64. And then they essentially um, showed some cool results that as you scale as you scale these models and then you, you take the representations and you do like fine tuning or, or do a linear probe on them for ImageNet or, or, or these data sets, uh, you can get results comparable to like some of the popular uh, self-supervised learning methods at the time. Um, the main caveat might be these methods are, are like GPDL in this case is pretty big. I think it was like one point something billion parameters, which is Sinclair, I, I believe, should have been a lot smaller. Okay, so 
yeah, so a lot of these past works have done just treating each pixel as a token. Um, is there a way we can get better tokens for images? And turns out there is a pretty good way that people have been using for a while is you just learn a discrete autoencoder. So if you're not familiar with what like a generic autoencoder is, it's basically just um, a model that will, let's say for images, it will take your input image and then it will downsample it through some process, maybe a bunch of convolutions, uh, striding, so on, into some sort of bottleneck Z. So Z ideally would be a dimensionality a lot smaller than the original X. So let's say a 256 by 256 image, maybe we want to compress it down to like 16 by 16 or 8 by 8 or something. And, and then after that you decode it through some sort of upsampling techniques, uh, and then you just train it with like a reconstruction loss, mean squared error, um, something like that. And the important part is that because for transformers we want, at least for autoregressive transformers, we ideally want the data to be discrete. So we want this encoding Z to also be discrete. And there's, we won't really cover them right now, uh, but there's a lot of methods in the past few years that have been used to learn discrete representations. So Gumball softbacks and concrete distribution are the same thing. It's basically like a discrete VAE. Um, this is what they also use as the autoencoder for Dolly, I believe. Um, VQ, vector quantization, VQ VAE, VQ GAN, stuff like that is what, what was fairly popular. Uh, a few years back, and then um, and then the most recent that we've uh, seen is something called finite scalar quantization or liquid free quantization, um, which maybe in the past year has probably started to, to gain more traction as as people have written papers about it. Um, but essentially, you can if you're interested, you can check out these papers. Um, but the core idea is here. These are all basically these are all basically ways to learn a, a discrete Z. They're kind of invariant to architecture, so it can be a CNN, CNN encoder, decoder, uh, but the quantization part is what these are all covering, how the quantization is done, how the gradients are passed through. Because if you just quantize things, then there's no gradients, usually. Um, so it's ways to address this issue, address these issues. And one thing to note that's actually different about, let's say, like for language, you have BPE for tokenization, or like you can do it by characters or by words. So those are inherently lossless algorithms. Uh, so you won't lose any information about the original text. But since these are autoencoders that are trained using neural nets and reconstruction error, um, they can encode images uh, into, or some modality into a discrete representation, um, but they are lossy by nature. So you can basically kind of control that with how much you want to downsample. So this was uh, the VQ GAN paper, uh, and they encoded, at least for one of the models, they encoded 256 resolution images down to uh, 16 by 16. So this is pretty large. This is a 384x compression in terms of bytes from raw pixels and a 768 reduction in, in sequence length of transformers. So that makes it much, much more tractable um, to train. This is going from like 190k sequence length down to like uh, like 256 or something. Um, so it makes it some like so like someone at only at Google can can train it versus someone I can train it on like my GPU. So. And the reconstruction is pretty good. You can, these are comparisons with other VAEs of like finer details on like a squirrel. Um, but it's, you have to really look into it to, to see any like really specific differences. Um, and then you can control it based on how much. So if you downsampled only to 32 by 32, then you could get even better reconstruction. Uh, or, or if you are more compute limited and you can only train on 64 tokens at a time, then you could try eight by eight and suffer some quality and reconstruction error, but then you can then train a transformer. Um, to, to actually sample like reasonable images, perhaps. So that's basically a hyperparameter. It's a function of like how much compute you have available and like how good of images you want to train or sample from. And these are some examples of samples from the VQGAN. I believe this was like also like text to image before it got super popular. So on Coco and open images, I think it's a similar data set, but larger. Starting to actually look like things, which is nice. And this is all not, not limited to discrete encode, uh, not limited to images. People have recently done this stuff for videos as research has shifted from uh, images to videos. Um, a paper called MagVid V2, where they, uh, you, you can ignore the, the leftmost one, but for the, for the middle one is basically a trained autoencoder, like with, I believe, 3D comms, stuff like that, so like a 3D CNN. Uh, they compared it to like um, popular video codecs for encoding. And they also compared certain properties in terms of 
like the, the compression rate and then how, how good it is. Um, essentially saying that their model performs very similar to even like the best video codecs and then even better than a popular one. In green. In blue and yellow, yeah. So pretty cool that we're starting to beat these actual compression. Uh, of course, there is like, if you really want to, like, of course, in terms of compression, there is also the aspect of the overhead of storing the original neural net. But theoretically, that could be amortized if you just encode more and more videos uh, forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the inputs? Yeah, so, uh, so exactly the same as in chess. So what they did was they, uh, they reconstructed, they encoded and decoded uh, videos, and then they, they paired them up with like, the baseline. And they had, they had human raters say which one is better. And then from that, you compute the yield score. Yeah, and then you can use this autoencoder and train an autoaggressive model. This is a recent paper, like a month or, month ago, I forgot, uh, or maybe a few weeks ago, uh, called Video Poet. And then you can generate some pretty cool videos of chickens lifting weights, you know, stuff like that. Always with animals doing funny things. I guess no one ever has any issue with that. Um, yeah. Okay. And then so. Outside of video generation or image generation, or kind of on a slightly separate vein than pure generative modeling, is kind of the interesting question of like, we have in-context learning for language, so we can prompt it with certain examples, um, and then it can, it can learn from that. So we, we can prompt it with like a task we make up, and then the language model can learn that, and then it can perform that task in, uh, for future generations. So like, what would the analogous thing be for images? Can we do like a visual prompting and have it learn a visual task, and then it can solve it after that. Uh, so if you had like, let's say you had no segmentation data at all, but you had like a lot of other random visual data, and then you, you, you curate three examples, you prompt it with three example segmentations, and you prompt it with a new random image. Um, that'd be pretty cool if, if the model could solve that as well. So what this paper did was essentially curate a lot of data on, on just different types of visual data. So videos is a really easy image, like sequential image data. Um, on the second row, it's hard to see. There's like stuff about rotations around, like a like three D rotations around objects, um, uh, doing things at different viewpoints. Uh, a lot of pair data, so any sort of image to image tasks. So if you can do pose detection, segmentation, uh, you can kind of like object detection is kind of image to image. If you have the original image and the image with the bounding boxes overlapped, um, depth like optical flow, depth, all, all that stuff. Um, segmentation masks, basically curating a bunch of data, and also segmentations for videos, stuff like that. Um, so about, yeah, 50 data sets, 40, 420 billion tokens, and then you just you just combine it all into one data set, mix it, and then you just train a, a big uh, autoaggressive transform on it. Um, and then what happens? So you can get kind of these neat uh, in context learning. So in, in blue is what is conditioned on, so that is uh, not generated. So it's given by the user. So this is kind of like a task of like key points on an object, I guess, um, as it rotates. And then you prompt it with essentially a, a new, like a, a novel object, and then ask it to, to create the rest of it. So I guess this was demonstrating task compositionality. Because I guess there were 3D rotation data, there, were key, there was key point data, and now it's like, can you do it both together? And then you can do other things. You can try to identify patterns. So first one is like person getting more sad, and then person getting more happy, or a smiley face. Um, things that are like increasing in number. Um, and the last one, I believe, it's like kind of like paired. So it's like a. Is it? You know what? I I don't know what the last one is. <laughs> um, oh wait, maybe it's getting more and more dark. I see, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and then aside from that, uh, you can basically, this tokenization strategy of learning like discrete autoencoders can extend to almost any modality. So for audio, you just train a discrete, uh, and on the bottom half, you just train a discrete autoencoder, and then you do an auto transformer. Um, in this case, also conditional on text but it's basically all the same.
And yeah, so like, I mean, so now if you can do this for any individual modality, it, there's nothing really stopping you from combining everything, throwing it into one giant model and just train on all of it. Um, so this was for, for Video Poet. They just trained an LLM on a bunch of different conditioning. So you can see they condition on text, uh, they condition on images and video uh, with, with like a video tokenizer, and then they condition audio with like an audio kind of like tokenizer. Um, and then the really nice thing is that this transformer is kind of generic enough in, in which um, the, at least the per parameters in the, the video poet LLM are shared across every modality. Um, there are some ta there are some modality specific ones like the the T5 encoder pro is like parameters purely for the text probably frozen though. Uh, the magnet V2 is also frozen purely is done to encode video. Same thing with audio. But but once they enter and get concatenated to the transformer. Those parameters are all shared across every modality, and it just learns to, to model all of it um, together. In this case, basically to predict both uh, video and or audio. So pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. And then the last thing for these transformers to talk about is related to caching. So the standard way, or the the most naive way to do the sampling is let's say you start with your input. So you have two tokens already generated, x1 and x2. And then you want to generate x3. So what happens is that, so this is like basically, you can think about as one, one attention layer. There'll be many staff, but for simplicity, you'll just have one layer here. And then there'll be more computation that will not include. So you compute uh, keys and values for all of the, the prior tokens, as well as the Q for the current one. You do attention. And then you, you feed it down, maybe more attention layers, and then eventually you output uh, a soft max distribution, then you sample. And so you get x3. And then you have x3. You do the same thing. You compute all the keys and values, the queries. You apply your attention. Uh, you follow down the network and sample x4. And then you keep going. And then you have x5. So uh, the annoying thing is that you have to compute the KVs. Like, like e even if I'm sampling the, the tenth time step, you have to compute all the KVs for uh, all the prior time steps, which also means that you have to run x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on all through the entire transformer network. Um, so it makes it very expensive. So it makes it every sampling pass is a full, is a full forward pass of the transformer. So it's basically uh, like, in this case for attention, it'd be like, elsewhere in operations. Uh, when in theory, we, we shouldn't need to. Um, because if you think about like the forward pass for a transformer, a single forward pass computes every conditional distribution, which in total is, is L squared flops, or, or something like that. Um, so in theory, each sampling step should only be O of L. And the way we do that is just we cache the Ks and Vs as we sample sequentially. So same starting point with X1, X2, you compute Ks and Vs initially, you do your Q, you sample. And then, and then basically the difference here is that when you computed the K and V here, before you would just throw them out. So they'll, they'll be collected by the garbage collector, uh, and then you'd have to recompute them. So in this case, you'd have to explicitly store, so you have to like have some code that explicitly stores this tensor inside of your, inside of your memory and keeps it persistent as you sample the next token and the next tokens. So you keep K1, uh, v1, k2, v2, then you x3 computes the new k3, v3, which obviously hasn't been computed yet, because it's a new token, and you compute q3, you do your attention. Uh, in this case, what you would do is you would take your k3, v3, and then you would concatenate it to your cache. So now your cache contains k1 to uh, k3, v1 to v3. Do your standard attention, and then you sample x4. Uh, so now you have your cache from k1 to k3. You compute K4, you would then concatenate it, uh, do attention, and, and yeah, and then you, you, you do this for however long, however, however long you want to sample. So the main cost here is that you're trading off essentially, uh, potentially in some sense, uh, like GPU memory for speed. Because this one you have to cache, like if your transformer has like uh, 10 attention layers, you have to cache these KVs for every single attention layer. Uh, which could get expensive if you have really long sequence lengths or um, if you have a really big model, so on. 
but it, it's like very worth it because it, it brings your sampling from O of L squared uh, down to O of L per, per step. So then for the entire, uh, the entire sampling scheme, it would be like naive sampling would be O of L cubed and caching would just be O of L squared. Cool, A any questions about this? Okay, yeah, so that was most of it on the main core stuff regarding transformers. And then there's, I guess this last section is some other stuff um, that is not core, but we thought would also be very good to, um, to know or at least be aware of, especially recent developments. So one of the things that I didn't fully cover was, was basically what I first covered was the predominant approach to training transformers. So you can think of like ChatGPT, OpenAI, like, R or Gemini are all trained called decoder-only models, so it's a single causally mass transformer, versus the original intention of all you need paper uh, that introduced the transformer used a different architecture called the encoder-decoder architecture, which is very similar. So here I have the, the I have the decoder-only here. So you just have the attention followed by feed forward, alternating, all causally massed, and so on. So this is a standard transformer we've been covering. Um, what the only added thing is that they have a separate transformer called which is the encoder, which would, in this case, the encoder is not mass, so it's bidirectional. So it would encode whatever input you have, um, and then the decoder on the right side would then condition on the output of the encoder. And the way it's conditioned and the way information is shared here is just through cross-attention. So the, the, the right half would attend, would cross-attend to the, the output of the left half. And, and in general, this is a pretty good architecture for in the case where you have a very clear conditional distribution of model. So in, in some sense, a very clear input output. So for machine translation, you have your source and target language. Uh, text to image generation is text and image. Image captioning is input as image, output as text. Uh, input as video, output as text. Summarization, input and output are both text, but very clearly structured in some way. Um, so in that case, the, these models uh, work pretty well. It just doesn't work well for, let's say, let's say chat GPT style, where you don't even know, like, or chat style models where you just don't know, like, what is input, what is output. Kind of like everything, like input will be output, or uh, output will be input eventually as you sample the model. So it makes it really hard to structure uh, an architecture like this. Um, but in general, these models are still not as widely used, but kind of used. Um, T5 is a very popular, text model that was used, and also success with that. Um, uh, Party is a text image generation model, um, and Poly is like an image to text generation models. Um, in, in terms of scaling, I think they both scale fairly similarly, um, but at least from what I've seen in papers around, that the encoder decoder models still seem to learn better representations, or at least ones that are easier to use. So for example, a lot of uh, text to image or text to video models would use T5 as an encoder. Um, because the, the T5 encoder learns a very good, because it, the encoder's job is to summarize the input text. So it's a good representation for a model to condition on. Versus for decoder only, it's like the last layer, like you could take the, la like the last layer representations, but then that is only used to predict the next token. So it could not produce, it might not produce a good representation for like the entire text as a whole. Uh, and then you could use middle layers, but from what I've heard, it's like kind of hard to use, yeah. Um, oh, I think it's it's because it's mainly so in terms of scaling, I think they're pretty similar. But for GPT, it's kind of hard to use. Like, it's because like if you want to use something as a chat interface, it's not clear what the input output delineation is, right? Um, Uh, okay. This is party. Um, example of also scaling these image generation models using like an encoder decoder model like this. You can see it gets much better as size increases, kind of as expected. Okay, uh, and yeah, so one of the other parts. Okay, so now moving away from transformers. Um, Last little bit on stuff that is not transformers, but still auto-aggressive, and things that could be, be more popular recently. Yes. Uh, 
use an encoder for recovery of it. Um, or how is conditioned? Yeah, let's say you want to do text image generation, right? Um, let's say you have we have a topic on the model, just like this, right? And we have defined text. Yeah, you can. How so. You yeah, so you can you can embed your text. So the so the output the encoder will output something like L L by D representation or like a tensor, and then you have the the, the middle block there is a cross attention. So the queries will be from the decoder hidden states, and then the KV will be from uh, the encoder output. So then you would so that the queues would would attend to the KVs from the encoder output, and that would happen for every layer. Yes. Yeah, I think in the end it depends on what your use case is. If you want to build like kind of like chat-like models, for example, you probably wouldn't want to use uh, encoder de uh, encoder decoder. If you have very specific tasks you have in mind, like image captioning, then um, encoder decoder could be useful. Um, but maybe even decoder only could be okay. Oh, I see. Um, I think both models would probably be similar performing. I, I, it would just depend on, yeah. It was, at that point, I think it would just depend on like, how, how big your model is, kind of more so invariant to like your specific architecture. OK. So yeah, so moving away from transformers, let's talk about some of the resurgence in recurrent nets been happening over last year or two. Um, so we definitely show that transformers can model very complex distributions, but scaling to long sequences, which is now something that everyone kind of wants to do, is very expensive because it's quadratic uh, with respect to L. And our prior RNNs are, are linear with, with respect to sequence length, um, but it's very slow because when you train it, you have to unroll each time step. So unrolling like 200,000 time steps is really painfully slow. Um, so now the question is like, OK, can we still have a recurrent model, but can we compute things in parallel for more efficient training? And one incarnation of this is called linear state space models. So if you consider like a, a linear state space model, very, uh, fairly simple. So um, you can essentially treat uh, x is the hidden state of your RNN, and u here is uh, the input. So you can, you can think about the input to like an attention layer. Um, and, uh, and, and y is your output. So it's basically just doing like a few, a few like multiply by a few matrices, and then multiply by another matrix and out outputting it. Um, there are some specifics about a, b, and c here have bars because they're, they're discrete, because the underlying state space model is continuous. Uh, and there's certain things that are done to like discretize this in a different sense than what we've been discussing. Uh, or, yeah, in a slightly different sense. Um, but I guess what's important is to consider A, B, and C as different matrices. So it's all fully linear. So there's no, there's no nonlinear in here. So I guess that's one of the key differences with the standard RNN, where you maybe have a tan H or something. Uh, in this case, everything is fully linear. And in terms of architecture of where you actually insert this state space uh, model is that you can think of it as a replacement for an attention. So the attention is there to model the temporal, uh, te temporal dependencies in the new data, in new data, and SSM is just one other way to model it, just ideally more efficiently, without uh, suffering like a lot of costs. So one way to parallelize this kind of model is that you can think about unrolling the sequence. So if you have your input, uh, your input that you use at each time step, and then how your your hidden state evolves. So x zero. Uh, to x1, to x2, to x3, and so on. You're, you're just applying the uh, the first equation there repetitively, and then uh, you eventually get certain factors as you expand out and like factor things around. And for y, it just looks very similar, but you're just applying a C matrix as well. Uh, and then if you do, if you write out its most general form, so yk is equal to to, to that, uh, you can essentially write it as a, a convolution. 
is, this is essentially um, kind of like a dot product, I guess, uh, is one way to think about it, where C A to the K B and C A to the K minus one B and so on is is one vector computed from like your parameters, and then your U zero U one U whatever is the input vector. And in this case, it's equivalent to basically a convolutional kernel. Uh, so you can rewrite this uh, state space unrolling as a convolutional kernel uh, of, with a kernel of length L. It's like a one-dimensional kernel of length L, which the, I guess the weights are there down below. So that's one way to compute this all in parallel. Um, the other one, which I won't really go into that much detail, is you can also do something called a parallel scan. Um, which is kind of very similar algorithmically if you want to think about how to like, if I, if I give you like an array of n, n numbers, what would be an efficient way to compute the sum of it if you had like multi-processing like multi available. So what you could do is you can group pairs and add them. So if you have like 12 numbers, you, you group them into the six pairs and then you add them all in parallel. And then, and then you, you, you keep doing that in, term, in, like, in chunks of like powers of two. And then you can then compute the output. Um, what ends up happening is that both of these methods are computationally very similar, um, at least in terms of sequence length, where they kind of scale off of, o of L, L log L. So not exactly linear, because the original, if you just do a forward, a forward scan of the, or if you do an unro unrolling of the original recurrence, it would be O of L. Um, but in this parallel form, since you're taking kind of advantage of like, um, for the convolution, you're doing like FFTs and stuff for some things. So that's where the log L comes from. Um, but it's not ideal because you're like wasting a little bit of computation um, to do this parallelization. Okay. Um, I will zoom through this. Uh, so another one is linear tension. Uh, this is basically like kind of like the standard tension setup, but rewritten. So in, 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 instead of using uh, like a soft math, you can write in terms of similarity, based on similarity weights. Where for attention, that is like the similarity weight, e to the, the dot product over root d. Um, and this paper was looking at different kinds of similarity functions, essentially. So you can approximate it just by tre treating this kind of as like a kernel, uh, as like a generic similarity function. So, so basically, to convert each feature vector into its corresponding like kernelized higher dimensional feature version. And then, so now it's basically just all purely linear. Like there's, there's no nonlinear in here anymore. It's just uh, dot products and matrix multiplications. Uh, and then because of that, you can then reorder some terms around, like on the right. So you can bring the Q out, and then you can compute the uh, KV transpose there. And that kind of removes some of the quadratic um, terms. But the really nice thing, I guess, is if you look at it in terms of like a causal model, um, the sum goes from, originally goes from j is equal to one to the sequence length n. Um, but if it's causal, you, you don't want to attend to anything in the future, so now it's from j is equal to one to i. <coughs> so now this is kind of recurrent, because if you want to do the next time step, it's j is equal to one to i plus one, and then i plus two. So then you, as you sample for this, for training you can still do it fully parallel, but as you do inference here, uh, your, essentially your recurrent state is the sum of j is equal to one up to your current time step. And then when you want to do the next time step, you just compute the outer product for the current time step, and then you, you add it. Um, so this also makes inference very fast for this case. And the last thing, am I talking about this, or? or okay, I can fit. All right, the last thing is um, basically complementary ideas to kind of tokenization. Uh, the main theme is kind of like learning hierarchical representations or learning uh, different factorizations of, of these data. So, for example, for super resolution, is instead of generating the entire MNIST image at a time, you can generate it hierarchically. So you can, or, or in this case, you can like, yeah, you can you can subsample like the 28 by 28 image into seven by seven uh, pixel grids, and then you can train a pixel CNN on that to generate seven by seven, and then you can train another pixel CNN that conditions on the seven by seven to predict the 28 by 28. In this case, it, it could be. You know, if you only have one GPU available and you can't fit the entire model, maybe you can break it up into two models, uh, and then you can train a better model that way. It could also be a slightly easier distribution to model. 
Yeah, and these are, I guess, other examples of uh, other data sets, faces, or uh, like the bedroom data set, I guess, Elson. Um, you can take it even further by doing learning different levels of hierarchies of like representations, uh, and then slowly upsampling that way, and you can get eventually to a pretty high resolution. These are still all, all auto aggressive, but uh, auto aggressive different levels of representations where you could potentially like focus more of your parameters on modeling the lowest levels of the representations, where that's more computationally efficient, and then at the super resolution levels, where at that point it's a much easier task because most of the image has been formed, it's just like maybe a little bit blurry. Uh, it's much easier to fill in the details that way. Uh, you can do similar things with doing grayscale first, then color. So in this case, this was colored MNIST on the examples with the, the pink and gray. But you can generate the first column first, which is black and white, and then you can train another pixel CNN that will condition on the grayscale version and generate the colored version. More examples for CIFAR, I think. Yep. I think that's it then. Cool. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Elson. Oh.